Um, we're going to start with April. April is a, a patient who um, uh, comes down to Bath from the east of England uh, from time to time for orthopaedic surgery. Um, she's had complications of anaesthesia in the past, so she has two sorts of um, arthritis, which leave her with a completely fixed neck. I can see that she's looking up here because I can see her eyes looking up, but if she looks down, her neck stays in the same position. She's had a number of regional anaesthetics and general anaesthetics. When she had a spinal in a previous hospital, uh, she had uh, such pain after it and complications from it that she would never uh, consider regional anaesthesia again. Um, subsequently, she was given a general anaesthetic. She was impossible to intubate, and as a result had a can't intubate, can't ventilate, or can't, vent can't intubate, can't oxygenate situation, and had to have an emergency surgical airway. During the emergency surgical airway, which did save her life, she was aware. So she suffered major complications of anaesthesia, and we're going to come back to April at the end of the talk. So although the talk is entitled Learning from Anaesthesia Complications, um, I prefer it to be improving quality and patient safety through learning from anaesthesia complications. And that's what the National Audit Projects, which have now been going for about uh, 11 years, um, are, are all about. Um, I must acknowledge primarily all UK anaesthetists, because in essence, this is not only uh, effectively not crowd-funded, but it's a crowd-performed uh, project. These projects are done by UK anaesthesia. There's almost certainly nobody uh, involved directly with anaesthesia care or intensive care medicine in the UK who's not been involved in filling in a form or sorting out a complication or dealing with something which was directly involved with one of the last four national audit projects. And I must mention the, the NAP leads who you can read, whose names you can read there who have been very important and the panel members who have spent um, countless hours reviewing cases and making the projects the quality uh, items that they are. There have been numerous reports in the NHS, very different in style, but all talking about patient events and learning from these major events, trying to make things better. I can reassure people that anaesthesia is very safe. So the, the, the mortality associated directly with anaesthesia has reduced about 12-fold from the systematic review said it reduced from 12-fold between 1970 and 1990. And I'm not going to go through the figures there, but you can see that the instance of complications, and this is from ASA1 patients in Japan in a large study, is incredibly small. So we're talking about complications that occur 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 600,000 patients. Sequelae, such as nausea and vomiting um, or, uh, or pain uh, that are significant, occur considerably more often. And we should contrast that, that um, infrequency of events in anaesthesia um, before we talk about our complications with the frequency of harm associated with the surgery, surgical package. Um, I don't think we should be in silos. I think a lot of what we do does impact um, on, on surgical outcomes. So I think we shouldn't just sit in our silo and say we have no complications and the surgeons have lots. Um, but I think it, it is worth comparing the two. Things do go wrong in anaesthesia. This is Myra Cabrera who had intravenous bupivacaine injected, in, uh, bupivacaine injected into a vein rather than into the epidural space and died. This is uh, Leslie Ash, who got an epidural abscess um, and uh, had neurological injury uh, several years ago. Uh, this is uh, a lady who had a failed intubation um, when she was having a caesarean section and died, leaving the new baby and, and the family without a mother. Uh, this lady had uh, unintended awareness during general anaesthesia and has post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and her life has been significantly impacted by that. Uh, and this gentleman died uh, last year as a result of anaphylaxis, perioptive anaphylaxis. So these major events do happen to patients and they have an impact on patients. There's a reason why I show photographs of people. Charles Vincent, the doyen of uh, quality improvement, um, uh, talks about keeping patients safe as being a, both a public health issue and also a human right. And the statistics at the bottom, in spite of some recent American data, are probably still true that one in ten inpatients do suffer iatrogenic harm, and, and a significant proportion of those do contribute to death. Atul Gawande, another doyen of quality improvement, um, has in his excellent book, uh, Better, has what are called five steps to positive deviancy. And I highlight three of those, measuring something, writing something, and being prepared to change. And I think those are at the heart of quality improvement. Um, and they are about what the NAPs um, involve. If we first look at expectations and the incidence of harm. So these are expectations. This is a, a nice study from about, about uh, I think, 1999 in the States. Where they asked patients, they gave patients, said, you've got $100. 
you can, you can um, avoid all these complications of anaesthesia, what are you going to spend the money on? And this is what they came out with. And largely they were trying to avoid relatively minor complications, what we would probably call sequelae of anaesthesia, apart from awareness. The same questions were then asked to a panel of expert anaesthetists, and they came out with a very different group of, uh, of, of things to avoid, um, which didn't really register on the, on the patient's um, uh, data, but death, uh, awareness with recovery, and nerve injury. Um, with the things that patients were, were more concerned about, the, the, the more frequent and less, less concerning things are right down here. So there's perhaps a, a, a disconnect between what patients their expectations about anaesthesia, we expect it to be safe, they expect it to be entirely successful, and what we as anaesthetists worry about. Um, now when things go wrong, people sometimes sue, and this is an analysis of UK litigation, and whichever way you cut it up, surgeons get sued, uh, and they cost more from being uh, litigated against, um, about 30 times more than anaesthetists. Um, uh, sorry, about, yeah, 25, 20, 20, 20 times more than anaesthetists. They may argue that that's because they do 20 times more work than us, but I don't think it quite works out like that. And if you look at the things that patients do sue about, so we're, we're a low-risk specialty for litigation, but when they do sue, it's about regional anaesthetic, anaesthetics, particularly obstetrics, inadequate anaesthesia, both regional and general anaesthesia, and airway problems. Dental I'm going to ignore because it's usually fairly it's less important. You can look at it as the frequency of uh, episodes of litigation or the overall cost or the cost per case or the severity and when we talk about severity then drug allergy and drug error and airway problems come into it much more importantly because these are big events. So that's a kind of a background to, to the safety of anaesthesia, what patients want, what cl clinicians are worry about, worried about and what the litigation shows us. On to the NAPs. So the NAPs are prospective, observational, registry-based, case series studies of rare events. And they examine these sorts of events, things that are important to patients and to us, um, and that, that are so rare that we cannot study them with randomised controlled trials or other methodologies. Um, importantly, the, the subjects that we study have been chosen by anaesthetists. The, there is no external funding that goes into funding these other than uh, the college funds which come from anaesthetists and therefore they're funded by anaesthetists and as I said at the start they are performed by anaesthetists from the shop floor upwards um, and therefore patient benefit. There are two phases, two, essentially two phases, a year-long collection period of uh, identifying major events of, of potential harm uh, that, can, that occur to patients and then a, a, a secondary uh, survey of activity of those sorts of, of those of the, around that activity. Uh, and then a review of all those cases um, and of the type of, uh, type of events, extracting all these pieces of information um, and eventually coming up with a report and recommendations on the topics. At their simplest, they are morbidity and mortality studies. So everybody is used to having, and anaesthesia has a proud history of, of, of um, anonymous morbidity and mortality meetings within departments and learning from these. And really, the NAPs are morbidity and mortality meetings on a national scale. These are the topics, as you know, that have been covered. Uh, central neuraxial block, epidurals and spinals, complications of managing the airway, accidental awareness, and perioperative anaphylaxis. Central and core to the process is the confidentiality of reporting, so that anybody can report a major event which may change a patient's life and may change the anaesthetist's, or more than one anaesthetist's, um, practice, but it may change their career as well, and they can report that to us. We will examine it, but there will be no comeback from us. Um, we won't know where that report has come from. We have a firewall, which means that we don't know which patient, which hospital it came from, uh, which clinician has reported it, um, or essentially when it happened. And that, uh, maintaining that firewall for the protection of those people that are reporting it and for the protection of the project is, is, is very important. Experts, and they are genuine experts, are then involved in reviewing the cases and extracting large amounts of structured information. And that, that is the key. It's not a chat. There's, there's a review meeting going on upstairs as, as, as I talk. And it's not a chat. It is hard work extracting what happened, how much was the patient harmed if they were harmed, what was the nature of that event, how was, how was care performed, was it preventable, and what do we learn from it. And it's a very structured sort of 
There's guidance as to how we fill in forms and we get very structured output. And there's a structured um, analysis of contributory or human factors elements as well. The review process involves uh, uh, small groups. So this is for NAP6, which is going on looking at uh, anaphylaxis, uh, severe allergy to anaesthesia. And we have small groups meeting to discuss four or five cases, forming their opinions about those cases, three different groups, and then they join together. So in the morning, we'll have had three groups like that. And then in the afternoon, um, uh, we get all together and, and, and conclude um, and moderate what we feel about those cases. That's supported by a national survey of activity. So this was for NAP5, and this was about which anaesthetic drugs were given to patients and how anaesthesia was managed. 22,000 returns from that survey, about one in 200 anaesthetics um, from four million uh, hospital episodes. We then put all that information together and form a report. Our challenges are around inclusion. We're looking at that. Are we, are we looking at the whole of the iceberg? or are we just looking at the tip of the iceberg? And we know that we're just looking at the major injury, but what does it tell us about the lesser injuries and the near misses? Um, confidentiality remains a challenge, and as does dissemination. Results, well, I can't tell you about results because it just isn't time, but they're all available everywhere. So there's open access. Everything that's ever been produced about the NAPs is, is open access. Uh, there are public launches. Um, there was a musical associated with NAP5, with NAP um, and there are lay summaries on the, on the NAP5 website. There are academic papers which have been successful and academic reports. Just to look at the scale, so as I, I say, they're M&M reports, but these are the previous studies that looked at accidental awareness prior to NAP5. These are all the studies from 1950 that looked at awareness and the number of cases that they reported during that time, and then this is NAP5. So NAP5 doubled the number of cases in the literature, including all case reports overall, and put the same number that were already existing in the literature into one uh, discussion so that we could learn from it in greater detail. And that's the strength of them, because it's not just m and this happened, oh, well, could you have done better? Uh, what might you have changed about this individual case? We extract themes and learning. So as an illustration of NAP3, we looked at 700,000 spinals and epidurals, 45% of them were spinals, 44% epidurals, 46% uh, were for obstetric indications and 41% were, were for perioptive care. The main complications were vertebral canal hematoma, abscess and ischemia. Um, and that shone a focus on those things. The overall risk of a complication from any central neuraxial block was one in 25 to 50,000. But we noticed that in perioptive care, Although those are only one in seven of the procedures, they were half of the complications, showing that they were a high-risk group, particularly epidurals. The risk of a vertebral canal hematoma, which we all spend a lot of time trying to avoid, a bleed into the, into the spine, is one in 20,000. Um, the risk of a major complication of permanent harm after a spinal is around one in 50,000, and of, after an epidural in the perioptive setting, about one in six to one in 12,000. We can then use those numbers to dive down into those areas of particular interest to look at these, these bigger complications, to look at the areas where the risk was highest, so perioperative epidurals. And then you can look at similar figures for NAP4 and NAP5, which I'm not going to have time to look at. But they've given us these new pieces of information, new prevalence, denominators, instances, patient stories, which are very important and very powerful, and risk factors. So vertebral canal hematoma, a small number of cases, but a significant number to, ga to gain themes from. There's never been a case series of, of epidural hematomas as big as that before. Looking at the perioperative, as I said, the perioperative epidurals, um, one in seven central axial block, but one in two cases. What do we learn from that? Well, we can put those numbers together, and now we can look at, we can communicate with patients now in a way that we couldn't before NAP4 about the risk of doing an epidural and the harm that might come from that and the potential risks that might come from not doing an epidural. Patient stories, these are the 80 patients in NAP4, they're not the 80 patients, they are pictures representing the 80 patients in NAP4 who had to have an emergency surgical airway or front of neck airway, whichever you want to call it. 13 of them died and seven of them had permanent injuries. No series before has ever been of that scale and there is now no discussion that happens about what type of airway approach is, is right for the front of neck that does not include discussion of NAP4. NAP4 also showed us that intensive care 
uh, the, the risk of complica airway complications leading to death or brain damage in intensive care is about 60-fold higher than it is in anaesthesia, and that has led to numerous discussions about that topic. But it's important that you're visible. There's no point in doing research if people don't see it. I like this quote from George Bernard Shaw. So you've got to be seen. So everything's available, visible. NAP3 was downloaded in 50 countries, 20,000 downloads in its first four months. It was reported in Marie Claire and the Tehran Times on the, on, on the same day, which I think is probably relatively unusual. Uh, NAP5, 400 websites reported it. And it was reported like this on, in, on the BBC News and like this in the Daily Mail. And they're, they're looking at it from different... They're looking at it from different ends of the, of the telescope, if you like, but I think both are equally valid. And it starts a discussion, and most of the reporting in the media from all these studies has been highly responsible. Have we changed practice? Well, previous work suggests it takes 17 years for research to change practice, and these have only been going for 10 years, so we shouldn't really have changed practice much at all. Um, but illustrative of NAP4, this is a paper uh, from a couple of months ago from the BJA. We surveyed... Um, the LC, the, the, the leads, the local leads of, of, the, of NAP4, two years after the project, and 98% of hospitals had, had changed practice in their hospitals, how they delivered care. An analysis we did, which we call closing the safety gap, so looking at what their performance was beforehand, um, and so how many, how many hospitals were complying with what we thought was perfect care in different, in different aspects of care before NAP4, and how many were, were complying with it afterwards. And therefore, the gap was the, the gap between existing and perfect care before NAP4, and closure of the gap was the percentage by which we closed that through NAP4. And in anaesthesia, 95% of hospitals made changes, and the gap closed about 50%. And in intensive care, where the biggest gap existed, the gap has closed by about 60%. I'm proud that that's happened, and I think most anaesthetists should be proud. But changing culture is the most important thing, because culture eat strategy for breakfast, and I'm not sure what Peter Drucker has, has eaten here, but he doesn't look very happy with it. I think it's a wasp. Um, there are now dedicated airway leads in the vast majority of hospitals. It will soon be 100%, but it's, it's approaching 90%, and they're able to change the culture in hospitals. There have been national recommendations about capnography directly as a result of NAP4. If you look at changing the culture, every guideline, I think, that's come out from the association so these are all driven by or, or significantly impacted by the, by the National Audit Project, and that, and that continues to happen. There's, a, there's one about awareness about to happen. And I think that, that, that they are pervading, and I think they're improving care. But we come back to April, and April, I've told you the, the history for her. I've learned a huge amount from being involved in the National Audit Project, and everything that I've learned comes down to how I treat April and how I treat other patients in whom, who haven't had those complications, but in whom I wish to avoid those complications, being aware of those risks, how frequently they may occur, things I might do um, as a result of the National Audit Projects and the learning we've got to try and avoid harm to the patients. And I think that my care uh, for April is much better as a result of the National Audit Projects. And I think those coming back, that incremental care, those little changes that we can make to our care is important, not just for patients who are at very high risk of complications, but also for everybody, every individual patient's individual care. Thank you very much.